going to miss her very much when she was gone. She did not miss her at all, in fact, and as she was a self-absorbed child, she gave her entire thought to herself, as she had always done. If she had been older, she would no doubt have been very anxious at being left alone in the world, but she was very young, and as she had always been taken care of, she supposed she always would be. What she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people who would be polite to her and give her her own way, as her Aya and the other native servants had done. She knew that she was not going to stay at the English clergyman's house where she was taken at first. She did not want to stay. The English clergyman was poor, and he had five children nearly all the same age, and they wore shabby clothes, and were always quarreling and snatching toys from each other. Mary hated their untidy bungalow, and was so disagreeable to them, that after the first day or two, nobody would play with her. By the second day, they had given her a nickname, which made her furious. It was Basil, who thought of it first. Basil, or Basil, possibly Basil. Basil was a little boy with Im impudent blue eyes and a turned up nose, and Mary hated him. She was playing by herself under a tree, just as she had been playing the day the cholera broke out. She was making heaps of earth and paths for a garden, and Basil came and stood near to watch her. Presently, he got rather interested, and suddenly made a suggestion. Why don't you put a heap of stones there, and pretend it is a rockery, he said. There in the middle, and he leaned over her to point. Go away, cried Mary. I don't want boys. Go away. For a moment, Basil looked angry, and then he began to tease. He was always teasing his sisters. He danced round and round her and made faces and sang and laughed. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. He sang it until the other children heard and laughed too. And the crosser Mary got, the more they sang. Mistress Mary, quite contrary. And after that, as long as she stayed with them, they called her Mistress Mary, quite contrary. When they spoke of her to each other, and often when they spoke to her. You're going to be sent home, Basil said to her, at the end of the week. And we're glad of it. I am glad of it, too, answered Mary. Where is home? She doesn't know where home is, said Basil, with seven-year-old scorn. It's England, of course. Our grandmama lives there, and our sister Mabel was sent to her last year. You are not going to your grandmama. You have none. You are going to your uncle. His name is Mr. Archibald Craven. I don't know anything about him, snapped Mary. I know you don't, Basil answered. You don't know anything. Girls never do. I heard father and mother talking about him. He lives in a great big desolate old house in the country, and no one goes near him. He's so cross he won't let them, and they wouldn't come if he would let them. He's a hunchback, and he's horrid. I don't believe you, said Mary, and she turned her back and stuck her fingers in her ears, because she would not listen any more. But she thought over it a great deal afterward, and when Miss Crawford
made her look yellower than ever, and her limp, light hair 
Yorkshire word and means spoiled and pettish. She had never seen a child who sat so still without doing anything. And at last she got tired of watching her and began to talk in a brisk, hard voice. I suppose I may as well tell you something about where you are going to, she said. Do you know anything about your uncle? No, said Mary. Never heard your father and mother talk about him. No, said Mary, frowning. She frowned because she remembered that her father and mother had never talked to her about anything in particular. Certainly they had never told her things. Mrs. Medlock answered, and it made him queerer than ever. 
when he shut the door, mounted the box with the coachman, and they drove off. The little girl found herself seated in a comfortably cushioned corner, but she was not inclined to go to sleep again. She sat and looked out the window, curious to see something of the road over which she was being driven to the queer place Mrs. Medlock had spoken of. She was not at all a timid child, and she was not exactly frightened, but she felt that there was no knowing what might happen in a house with a hundred rooms, nearly all shut up. A house standing on the edge of a moor. What is a moor? She said suddenly to Mrs. Medlock. Look out of the window in about ten minutes and you'll see, the woman answered. We've got to drive five miles across Mistlemore before we get to the manor. You won't see much because it's a dark night, but you can see something. Mary asked no more questions, but waited in the darkness of her corner, keeping her eyes on the window. The carriage lamps cast rays of light a little distance ahead of them, and she caught glimpses of the things they passed. After they had left the station, they had driven through a tiny village, and she had seen whitewashed cottages in the lights of a public house. Then they had passed a church and a vicarage and a little shop window or so and a cottage with toys and sweets and odd things set out for sale. Then they were on the high road, and she saw hedges and trees. After that there seemed nothing different for a long time. Or at least it seemed a long time to her. At last the horses began to go more slowly, as if they were climbing up hill, and presently there seemed to be no more hedges and no more trees. She could see nothing, in fact, but a dense darkness on either side. She leaned forward and pressed her face against the window just as the carriage gave a big jolt. Hey, we're on the moor now, sure enough, said Mrs. Medlock. The carriage lamps shed a yellow light on a rough-looking road, which seemed to, cut, to be cut through bushes and low-growing things, which ended in the great expanse of dark apparently spread out before and around them. A wind was rising and making a singular, wild, low-rushing sound. It's... It's not the sea, is it? said Mary, looking round at her companion. No, not it, answered Mrs. Medlock. Nor it is in fields nor mountains. It's just miles and miles and miles of wild land that nothing grows on but heather and gorse and broom, and nothing lives on but wild ponies and sheep. I feel as if it might be the sea. If there were water on it, said Mary, it sounds like the sea just now. That's the wind blowing through the bushes, Mrs. Medlock said. It's a wild and dreary enough place to my mind, though there's plenty that likes it, particularly when the heather's in bloom. On and on they drove through the darkness, and through, and though the rain stopped, the wind rushed by whistled and made strange sounds. The road went up and down, and several times the carriage passed over a little bridge, beneath which water rushed very fast, with a great deal of noise. Mary felt as if the drive would never come to an end, and that the wide, bleak moor was a wide expanse of black ocean, through which she was passing on a strip of dry land. I don't like it she said to herself, I don't like it, and she pinched her thin lips more tightly together. The horses were climbing up a hilly piece of road when she first caught sight of a light. Mrs. Medlock saw it as soon as she did, and drew a long sigh of relief. Said, for when the carriage passed through the park gates, 
which nearly met overhead, made it seem as if they were driving through a long, dark vault. They drove out of the vault into a clear space and stopped before an immensely long, but low-built house, which seemed to ramble round a stone court. At first, Mary thought that there were no lights at all in the windows, but as she got out of the carriage, she saw that one room in a corner upstairs showed a dull glow. The entrance door was a huge one, made of massive, curiously shaped panels of oak studded with big iron nails and bound with great iron bars. It opened into an enormous hall, which was so dimly lighted that the faces and the portraits on the walls and the figures in the suits of armor made Mary feel that she did not want to look at them. As she stood on the stone floor, she looked a very small, odd little black figure, and she felt as small and lost and odd as she looked. A neat, thin old man stood near the man servant who opened the door for them. You are to take her to her room, he said in a husky voice. He doesn't want to see her. He's going to London in the morning. Very well, Mr. Pitcher, Mrs. Medlock answered. So long as I know what's expected of me, I can manage. What's expected of you, Mrs. Medlock, Mr. Pitcher said, is that you make sure that he's not disturbed and that he doesn't see what he doesn't want to see. And then Mary Lennox was led up a broad staircase and down a long corridor and up a short flight of steps and through another corridor and another until a door opened in a wall and she found herself in a room with a fire in it and a supper on a table. Mrs. Medlock said unceremoniously, Well, here you are. This room and the next are where you'll live and you must keep to them. Don't you forget that. It was in this way Mistress Mary arrived at Misselwith Manor, and she had perhaps never felt quite so contrary in 